You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, Get the point. Good. And now... Bend Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Oh uh, man, I gotta tell you, that Moosey logged into the RLM chat. <laughs> Just perfect timing, because she's feeling hot, 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 and Moose Girl <laughs> shows up. Talk about hotness. Hot sauce, Miss Moosey. <laughs> Oh, guess what? Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocketeer here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 3, also on the RLM.xyz. Um, yeah, RLMRadio.xyz. Oh, it's not hot there? Dang, woman, it's 90 and it's gone down out here. <laughs> oh, and Flash, <laughs> Flash Nasty's got your hot sauce. I got your hot sauce right here. Oh, damn, Moose, I will trade you 69 degrees. Holy crap. Want to trade? <laughs> oh, let me see. Where do I got to go? Uh, besides crazy. Crazy! I've gone crazy. Yeah, it's because I was playing out in the weeds today. Pulling freaking bindweed. Whoever brought that shit over. I know they brought it over during the dirty 30s with a dust bowl and hoping to keep from losing so much topsoil. But good lord almighty. That stuff's got roots that go all the way to hell. <laughs> Yoinks. I've been, uh, yeah, I was out pulling weeds a good share of the day. And I got hot, hot, hot and sweaty. And apparently... By the time I decide, well, one of the contributing factors to why I decided to call it quits on the pulling weeds front was because apparently I had made it on the menu of every damn fly in the county. Apparently, hot and sweaty Grammy smells tasty to flies. <laughs> Go figure. Ew. Oh, well. Let's see. Over here on Twitter, I lost another stalker. Damn it. I'm still over 400, though, so I am an overachiever. Yeah, just in my mind, I am. So, hey. But thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out over here on Twitter. Not a whole hell of a lot going on over there today. Um, yes. Oh, Vinny's here. Vinny. Uh, what is that? Top story. Rand Paul blocked in bid to end indefinite detention of Americans. Ah, shock, shock, shock. Feeling shocked, shocked, shocked. <laughs> Not. Okay, let's see. Over here on this effing site, that Freedoms Network, which, by the way, if you got some spare, just a little bit. I know it's hard to find spare, but if you got some and you want to keep another site that's open, that's free, that that helps you know, people spread the word. Come on over to freedomsnetwork.com and donate, please. Because if we don't get enough to cover the server fees, it's going down June 23rd. So, thank you, Grimner, for sharing me over here on this FN site. I also see the lovely Estrellas over here sharing about that young lady over in Palestine, the nurse that was shot by a freaking sniper. Isra Haley Sniper. Yeah, she had her back turned, too. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, apparently she threatened somebody, or they felt threatened, you know, with her back to them. How arrogant can she be to be going to heal, or try to heal, or at least tend to wounds of those that they'd already picked on? Captain Assholios. Oh, bless her heart. In any case, yes, lovely Estrella. Grimner is over here. Uh, who else is over here? Uh, KD Troxel and Loki Luck and yours truly. Ah, go figure. Now, over here on Fakey Book, not a whole hell of a lot going on over on Fakey Book either, except for, what's this? Oh, yeah. Um, Darwin has decided that he would like to help. <laughs> because, um, 
I share this little meme that says, don't lead, because I'll wander off board. Uh-huh. Don't follow, because I'll get you lost. Walk beside me and help me cause trouble. <laughs> There's trouble in front of me and trouble behind, but I have a big bet. A big bat, and I have trouble in mind. <laughs> I kind of stole a little bit from Dr. Seuss and uh, tweaked it just a wee bit. Yes, I am somewhat troubling. Somewhat troubling. Um, oh, yeah, Darwin, I understand, sweetheart. Oh, and I've been sharing Chad Prather, too. Um, the um, life sucker alert. Yeah. There are an awful lot of life suckers out there. You know those people that are, you know, they suck the life force right out of you. I call them vampires. You know, they're, they're good mood vampires. They just suck all that goodness. Kind of like the leeches that be that seem to think that they control things simply because we let them. Seriously, we let them. That's how they've been getting away with it all these years because people let them. I know that sounds really simplistic and very naive, but it really is basically when you break it down. Basically, that's the way it works. We go, yes, sir. Right away, sir. Just follow an order, sir. No. Stop saying sir, because that means slave I remain. Stop saying that. Stop it. Okay, let's see. So I've done the Twitter thing. Uh, should courts make baby mothers show receipts for what they do with child support payments Ooh, that's a bit of a slippery slope just a bit okay I'm gonna go ahead and shut that uh, over here on mines thank you RLM over here on mines for sharing me I really appreciate that over here don't know that there's a whole hell of a lot paying attention but hey I've been here 2017 just reminded it so booyah hey there darling how you doing this evening hope it's not too hot and sticky in your neck of the woods um, be drift be different and always stand out I am different <laughs> Trust me, I am not your normal Grammy. Oh, well. Um, and now, let's see. I've been to Minds. I've been to F and Site. I've been to Twitter. Been to Facebook. I guess that means it's time for me to get over to the one place where you need to be if you want to give me static and join in the chat. Come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Click on, you know, think of a nickname. Join the chat. Give me some shit. All the people in the chat will give it right back to you. And I will too when I eventually see it. But yeah, make it fun. Whip it out. Whip it good. <laughs> oh well. And if you're listening on Spreaker, come on over to Real Liberty Media. Because my shit internet, yeah, I can't do that many chat channels at once. Or it starts really making things goofy. So come on. If you want to say something to me and you're listening on Spreaker, Come on over to Real Liberty Media and uh, say it to me there. Come on. I triple dog dare you. In any case, right up top, I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. He tweets me. And it was good for me, Barman. Was it good for you? <laughs> I also see Grimner, who is the RLM god, and the lovely Moose Girl, who is feeling hot, 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 although she's got quite comfortable temperature going on. Um, and they will be on later on this evening for the Freakers Ball. Am I correct, or is it going to be balls to the wall? I never know, because Moosey actually has a life away from her home, especially now that her youngins are, quote-unquote, of age. And so, yeah, she can go and, and start empty nesting it. Honey, it only sucks for a little while till you get used to the quiet, and then when they come home, it's like, you said you're going to leave when? <laughs> I love my children I love my grandchildren but man oh man I love my house when it's nice and quiet after they all go home yes I do man capable of great compassion and great violence yes that's true Vinny that is true it's like the um, what is that old Cherokee saying or that's the the meme I saw um, inside of each one of us we have two wolves we have a dark wolf and a light wolf. And the dark wolf is jealousy and anger 
and hatred and fear and the light wolf is love and compassion and caring and nurturing and when you want to know which wolf will win in the constant battle that's going on it's the one you feed oh balls to the wall this week and next week damn moosey really does have a life you go girlfriend we got all kind of shit going on in town tomorrow but i um, no no i'm not going i number one i really don't give a shit about car shows and garage sales no if i'm going to do a garage sale it's because i'm selling shit and even i don't do that i take it to the second time around short uh shop i just donate it and say here this is still good i only wore it a couple of times and then i decided to feed my face and now it no longer fits <laughs> That's a lot of times what happens. So, yeah, second time around shop gets all of my garage sale items. So, I don't do garage sales anymore. I have enough. Thank you very little. It's basically like a community let's swap and then next year we'll swap back kind of thing. You know, unless you go across the state, you're not going to see anything new there. Sorry. Okay, back to saying, hey, hey, Kate. The lovely Kate is here down in the great state of Florida, where it's always warm, except for when it's not. Woofy. Hi, Chloe. I also see Asmo is in the chat. Ooh. Did I get it? Well, you damn duck. Son of a gun. It didn't recognize me. Sunny beaches in California. Mm, Chloe, it didn't like you either, but Java, hon, how'd you do that? Oh, see ya, anti. I see how you are. Okay, I didn't even get around to saying hi to you, and you already left. Vanny quit Putin in the radio. Uh, Asmo, the lovely Beth Z. Hey, Beth Z, I saw you chatting earlier today. That was while I was coming in, getting a drink of water, and going back out to attack the weeds. I also see Chalcedony is in the house, as well as a double dip in a Chloe. Yours truly is here, as well as I be Don C. Looky there, Java, 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 Dr. Two, the bestest duck friend in the whole wide world. 333, that's an angel angelic number, Java. Dude, that's like the God number. You are the duck god. <laughs> Don't friend anymore, honey. Because now you are a duck god. <laughs> it's my story and I'm sticking to it. I also see JJ's is still logged in. Although over on Twitter I saw him say good night for the night. And, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, oh, 333 is the devil's mini me. <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, damn it. See, when you're out in the heat and the pollen and your face is down there in the wind, in the weeds and all that shit, you get a little bit of a hacky going on, which is why I'm doing the water. Okay, to carry on. Uh, JJ's Juana Taco. Hi, Juana Taco. I have no idea what I'm doing for supper tonight. I have tuna. I'll be doing something with tuna. I also see the lovely Rain is in the house. How you doing, sweetheart? And RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. And Rascal has just joined us, jumped up on my lap. Trying to make it even warmer, aren't you, sweetheart? Thank you very much. Looky there, Rob Works is in the house. Hon, did you do the bubbler? I see the F and Royals and all that other fun stuff. But I don't see no bubbler going on. Where's the bubble action? Tiny bubbles in the wine. I know, rascal. I shouldn't do that, should I? Um, trust no one is here. Hi, you trusty feller, are you? I also see Beetle. Beetle. Beetle, 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 Beetle. I love Beetle. He's such a sweetheart. He's kind of a crazy man, but I still love him. I also see Colfax 101 is logged in, but marked away. I didn't looky there. Dakota. It's finally getting into livable temperatures, I think, up in the Dakotas. Dima. Hi, Dima. How you doing, sweetheart? And Flash Nasty with the, what kind of sauce was that again? The hot sauce? You got your hot, hot sauce there. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> oh, well. 
Let's see. Oh, Moosey's got some Chinese elms. I do not like the Chinese elms. They, they're so prone to disease. Oy. But I prefer them to them damn locust trees with their bean pods and the thorns. E. Tom W. just joined, too. Okay, I need to finish saying hey. Where am I at? Flash Nasty with that. I got your hot sauce right here. I see Frumpy is in the house. Hey, Frumpy, how you doing? I be Don C. Woik is here. See, we got double dipping on I be Don C. Kozu is in the house as well as Moy, 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 Moy. And we have a lot of poxes going on. Not as many as usual, but we do have the pox going on. We have a pox box and poxified and poxophone, but the poxy home ain't here. And looky there, Pompo Pond Sauce is logged in as well as Skittle, the F bomb um, master. Yeah, we'll just put it at that. He's so skilled at dropping them. Tom W. Hi, Tom. How you doing, sweetheart? And Vinny. E-E. I-I. Vinny. I-I. 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 He is the Vinny Bandito. Hey. And to round out the crew, the one, the only, the Phantom. Hey, Phantom. Chinese elms are diseased. Well, yeah, I could agree with that, Grim. I have two of them that are in the process of being taken down but you know spare time and weeds yeah because they're trying to overrun the garden anti is back anti yay okay now i had seen something the other day Vinny had said something about jules was um calling it with ucy and uh, after the first cup and it's like bummer dude at I mean, I listen to Jules a lot of time on the replay, because I just, I'd, I've been to UCY a few times, and, 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 yeah, the chat just really didn't hold my attention. Although, I gotta admit, I do have a tendency to squirrel. I know that shocks you. But, <clears throat> in any case, the lovely Jules is taking a break. And I can't say as a blamer. Way to go, girlfriend. Take a break. Take some time off. Compose yourself. Get back to, you know, get back in touch with what's really after that first cup. Ouch, rascal. Your claws hurt, sweetheart. And you're piercing the girls. And those are not to be pierced. Sorry. Okay, but in any case, Grimmy said that Miss Jules covered this. Um... Aye, aye, Vinny, aye. Okay, what movie was that from? I'm trying to, aye, I don't remember. There's a certain movie that that's, <laughs> I'll think of it. It'll be one of them squirrely moments, let me tell you. Okay, what's this? Grimmy just posted a link. What, 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 what? What's that link? Untitled, oh yeah, yes. What has less value than a penny? Yeah, that same penny tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's why we can't have nice things. Because we keep believing that you have to do the whole monetary exchange bullshit. Because nobody seems to be taught that personal responsibility and taking pride in a job well done are, um, isn't enough. You have to have moolah, moolah, money, money, money. And you have to get ahead and you have to be rich beyond your wildest dreams. And, which means that odds are someone else is going to be poor beyond your most vivid imagination. So, in any case, I'm not saying that the rich person caused it, but it, that's you can't have one side of a spectrum without having the other. That's why, you know, it's how a spectrum works. You have one end and the other and lots of middle ground. And a lot of us are in that middle ground. And since there's so many of us in that middle ground, why don't we just make it all a middle ground? I know. Oh, there I go, talking like a commie. No. No. I'm not being a commie. I'm not thinking that someone else should decide how much I should have and what is my equal share and that, and that someone else, okay, if I overproduce, then someone else can come and take whatever I produced. I'm saying that what you do is if you overproduce then you find someone else that has a need for it and if they happen to have something that you would like to have just trade not a barter just a swapping 
It's like, okay, you can use this. Awesome. Hey, I could use, sweet. You know, no monetary, no finances, no none of that shit. None of it. Just the pride in a job well done. And being able to maybe help your neighbors. I don't know. Uh, call me crazy. <clears throat> in any case, the lovely Miss Jules covered this today on her last show for at least a while. And it's from LiveScience.com. Thank you, Grim, for sending me this. And uh, the title, as soon as I read the title, it reminded me of a joke. But i got to read you the title first. So, you may have a second brain. That means dos, two heads. Well, no, not two heads, but two brains, which is kind of scary. And that second brain is in your butt. And it's smarter than you think. Now... That leads me to a joke that I know I've told it several times and I know I'll probably bugger it up. But <clears throat> all of the internal organs were arguing about which one was more important. And basically it came down to the heart, the lungs, the brain, and then the asshole chimed in. And you know, the heart, the lungs, the brains, they were laughing at the asshole. Because the lungs were going, yeah, if I stop working, you can only last so many minutes and then you're done. And the heart says, yeah, well, you know, if I stop working, then you can last even less time, and the <laughs> you're done. And the brain says, yeah, but if I stop working, well, then you guys can work to your heart's content if you want to, but it's not going to do a damn bit of good because the brain's dead, and it's just, you're just going to lay there and be a lump. And the asshole says, actually, guys, I am the most important organ of all of you. And they're all laughing. God, they thought that was funnier than hell, so the asshole quit working. Pretty soon, got kind of hard for the brain to think. Next thing you know, the lungs are having a hard time. You know, in and out. It's getting painful to in and out. And then the heart is having a really hard time trying to function. And they finally just go, okay, okay, you win. And the asshole lets go and everything gets fine again. So see, sometimes the one th that is the real control mechanism is the asshole. Sometimes you have to be one. Not all the time, but sometimes you have to. And you need to recognize its importance. So... Now, now that I've totally butchered that joke, <laughs> back to this article. Did you know that mammals are thought to have a second brain, a gut brain in their colons, which, yeah, trust your gut, that's your instinct, and new studies provide evidence of the gut brain's smarts. Yeah, if you get a weird feeling in your gut when you meet someone, that's usually your gut trying to tell you, this is bad juju, you stay away from this person, whatever falls out of their mouth. Uh-uh, don't trust it. Your gut, your brain will be going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But your gut's going, dude, seriously, seriously, don't make me release the asshole. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I am not shitting you, pun intended. So, uh, you're reading these words because you have a brain in your head. But did you know you also have a brain in your butt? Okay, well, it's not literally a brain. More like an autonomous, auto, autonomous. There. See, I'll bet Jewel made it through that word a hell of a lot better than I did. <laughs> it's an autonomous matrix of millions of neurons that can somehow control intestinal muscle movements without any help from your central nervous system. And these neurons don't actually live in your butt, but they do live in your colon or large intestine. You know, that tube-like organ that connects the small intestine to the rectum. How bad was I don't know, but rectum. Uh, and shepherds, uh, oh yeah, shepherds what remains of the food that you ate through the final leg of the di digestive tract. In other words, it goes, okay, let's gather up all the shit. Now, everybody, out of the pool, into the stool. Yes, I see a flasher going on. Bunch of buttheads. <laughs> That's right, Grim. Okay, 
So scientists call this site of colon intelligence your um, enteric nervous system. And because it can function without instructions from the brain or spine, some scientists like to call it your second brain. I know so many people that think with that one most of the time. So how smart is the autonomous intestinal brain. Well, I haven't tested it lately, but you know, I haven't had, you know, jalapenos for a while. Uh, <clears throat> scientists don't know for sure yet, but according to a new study in mice published May 29th in the Journal of J. Neurosic, N Neurosci, J. Neurosci, the answer might be pretty smart for an intestine. Well, you know, I think intestines are pretty smart because when you get some nasty stuff in there, let me tell you, they are in a real hurry to get that shit out. Get it out. I don't care how, but we's going to evacuate the building. So obviously, you know, especially those of you that have had a few too many of the adult beverage thing, and, you know, your your brain's going, you need one more, and that's it. And your intestines are going, don't go there, man. Don't go there. You really don't want to do that. And the stomach's going, please, serious. He's he's not kidding. Please, come on, don't go. And then the brain goes, we can handle one more. And yeah, and then the intestines get the last laugh, don't they? Every time they do, which is why I don't do that anymore. <laughs> And, and I do it a lot less as well. So, <coughs> the enteric nervous system, or ENS, thank you for the little abbreviation, contains millions of neurons essential for organization of behavior of the intestine. In other words, all of those little guys are like little minions, and they're going around going, <laughs> we're so freaking drunk. Let's just flush the system, because, man, I feel lousy. They do. Seriously, it's what happens. I know. In any case, um, apparently this was written by a team of researchers from Australia, down under, and they should know, who observed the so-called second brain, um, second brain hard at work using a combination of high precision neur neuronal imaging techniques. Okay, if you're talking about putting a camera up no no I would not volunteer for that in any case when the researchers stimulated isolated mouse colons with mild electric shocks they saw a novel pattern of rhythmic coordinated neuronal firing <laughs> walking poots popped into my mind for some dumb reason poor little mice, and that corresponded directly to muscle movements in nearby sections of the large intestine. Walking poots. Poop, 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 poop. Feel it. Poop, poop, poop. Okay, <laughs> move along. These rhythmic and synch synchronized blasts of neuron, as well as probably other matter, actively, um, or this activity likely helped to stimulate specific sections of intestinal muscles at a standard rate. Ah, so it's like a tempo, okay. Um, apparently this ensures that colon muscle contractions, also known as colonic migrating motor complexes, why do you have to call it something? It's just that it's the Play-Doh fun factory of life. <laughs> They keep fecal matter moving in the right direction, out of the body, and at a very steady pace. Cool. See, it is. It's like the Play-Doh Fun Factory, you know? It's got a little handle, and it just goes... Okay, maybe not a little handle, but... <clears throat> The, uh, this re or, yeah, this revealed the activity of the ENS can temporarily coordinate the muscle activity over significant distances along the length of the colon, the team wrote. And according to researchers, similar synchronized neuron routines are also common in the early stages of brain development. So, obviously, those that think with their backside or have a, a very immature or underdeveloped brain. Makes sense. 
Okay, this could mean that the pattern that they identify in the colon is the primordial property held over from the early stages of the um, enteric nervous system evolution. I know, rascal, you're trying to help, but you're not being much help, sweetie. But, <coughs> buh -buh, and that's just with one T, it could be even more important than that because some scientists hypothesize the enteric nervous system, or ENS, I'm just going to keep saying ENS, that sounds a lot easier. It actually evolved before the nervous system. Well, yeah, because before you can talk, before you can control your movements, you're shitting. Just saying. So, um, okay, I need a drink. So, <clears throat> the uh, neuron firing pattern in your colon might represent the earliest functioning brain in your body. Yeah, yeah. So that part, you know, until you got a big head and decided that that one worked better, that one was always saying, let's get this shit out of here. Let's just get the shit out and move on, okay? But no, you had to go and get a big head. So... I know I'm poking fun. I'm sure Jules did a much better job at this. Because <laughs> I'm also sure that Miss Jules probably didn't make as many snarky remarks. But uh, uh, bless your heart, Jules. I love you, darling. I'm a little bit more of a smart ass, I think. In any case, <clears throat> back to this article. Yes, that would mean that the brain in your butt could actually be your first brain. Sometimes it's the only option that a lot of people have. Not that they don't have a second brain, you know, the one because it got so big in their head. They no longer use it. They just kind of keep it there so that their head doesn't deflate and then their glasses don't fall off. But they use their butt for thinking because they always have shitty ideas. In any case... Um, so, if this is true, you can say mammalian brains evolved from the first move poop or poop move and then to take care of more complex business. Huh. Well, you know, sometimes getting rid of the shit is, is key to survival. However, this is the first time since neuron firing pattern has been detected in the colon and so far, it's been found only in mice. I'm not, I'm not volunteering for you to study that on me. Sorry. The researchers are confident that their findings could apply to other mammals too. But clearer understanding of the ENS powers in humans will require further study. And lots of serious thinking from both brains. And you know what? I really honestly think that if they wish to study that and see how there is a certain sector of the human population that actually has a reverse reaction with this stuff, they're politicians. Everything that comes out of their mouth is shit. So, you know, not only they're, they're an equal opportunity opportunity shitter it can come out the bottom or it can come out the mouth and sometimes you just plain you don't want to hand them a napkin just give them the toilet paper because it got a little stuck on their teeth hmm. that's just part of being a politician though so okay what's this catching up in the chat Uh, okay. What? Dope coin back? Coins? Oh, you guys are talking about all of your coins. Drifting troubadours. Sweet! Okay. I'm going to go ahead and put this over in the effing site as well. Just because it is pretty funny. <laughs> And you know the guy, the, the pose of the thinker? Do you ever stop to realize that maybe he's got that pose for a reason? He's really thinking. <laughs> uh, really thinking. So, I pooed. Hey, that's funny. My little emoticon things, it's I pooed. 
<laughs> oh, I'm so easily entertained. Yes, Vinny, I said easily. Okay, so now that I started with that one, that helped me decide one of the pot, one of the things that I have in my pocket. Um, there. Speaking of brains, brains, brains. Do you have one? Are you using it? By the way, that whole thing of we only use 10% of our brains, bullshit. I call bullshit. We really need to stop using that because you really do use your whole brain. You may only use 10% of the actual projected capacity of your brain or abilities of your brain, but you do use your whole brain. Seriously. Okay, so this is from I believe in MotherNature.com. Scientists discover biophotons in the brain that could hint our consciousness is directly linked to light. And God said, let there be light. Thank you, Grimner. Scientists found that neurons in mammalian brains are capable of producing photons of light or biophotons. And the photons, strangely enough, appear within the visible spectrum. They range from near infrared through violet or between 200 and 100 and th or 1300 nanometers. Now scientists have been or have an exciting suspicion that our brain's neurons might be able to communicate through the light. Go into the light. No, don't go into the light. I read something the other day about that. Don't go into the light because that just keeps you recycling. If you don't want to recycle, if you want to get out of this and stop being an energizer bunny for whoever's doing this shit, don't go. Stick around. Mess with your friends. Walk through walls. It's cool. You know, this, as opposed to being drunk and thinking you can and breaking your nose. <laughs> oh, well. <clears throat> they suspect that our brain might have op optical communication channels, but they have no idea what could be communicated. See, your thoughts are energy. It's energy waves, and it's being, it's actually being seen in light. But yeah, it's energy waves. I mean, what the hell else is an EEG? Is that electroencephalograph? Is that what that's called, or whatever? So. It's energy coursing through your brain. Or in my case, it's cobwebs that get to stirring, and whenever they touch, then a spark ignites. Kind of like when you bite a wintergreen lifesaver. Moving along. So, even more exciting, they claim that if there is an optical communication happening, the biophotons our brains produce might be affected by quantum entanglement. That's my cobwebs. Meaning that there can be a strong link between these photons, our consciousness, and possibly what many cultures and religions refer to as spirit. You are not your brain. You are not this body. You are something completely different just using this casing to experience this reality. So, in a couple of experiments, scientists discovered that rat brains could pass just one biophoton per neuron a minute, but human brains could convey more than a billion biophotons per second. So, once again, the rats, those, I, you know, I'm sorry, Animal Kingdom, for, you know, equating you with politicians, but it just works so well you know, with the programming that I've got, that, you know, politicians, they have one bio photon per neuron a minute. In other words, they don't think for themselves, yes, master, Dirk my chain, assholes. <clears throat> In any case, so this raises the question, could it be possible that more light one can produce and communicate between neurons the more conscious they are? Well, okay, once again, I refer to rat brains and politicians. Yes, I see it flashing. What's going on? <laughs> yes, Vinny, you are. Yes, you are. So, 
If there is any correlation between biophotons, light, and consciousness, it can have strong implications that there is more to light than we are aware of. Duh! Duh! Just think for a moment. Many texts and religions are dating way back since the dawn of human civilization have reported of saints ascended or ascended beings and enlightened individuals having shining circles around their heads and here you know i thought that was just a flame shooting out because i really really wanted to give someone a hug around the neck until they shut up but obviously there's people that are very good that do this too from ancient Greece and ancient Rome to teachings of Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, among many other religions, sacred individuals were depicted with a shining circle in the form okay, with a shining circle in the form of a circular glow. Did you have to have circle and circular in that? I'm editing. <laughs> but yeah, they do. They had this Ooh, maybe they are truly enlightened. Maybe they actually are activating a lot more neurons thinking a little bit higher thoughts than the bulk of humanity. So, if they were as enlightened as they are described, maybe these shining circles was just a result of the higher consciousness they operated with, hence a higher frequency and production of biophotons. And maybe these individuals produced a higher level of biophotons with stronger intensity because of their enlightenment if there is any correlation between biophotons and consciousness. Or maybe they were just brilliant individuals. Maybe that's why people are called brilliant. Wow, he's really bright. Hey, all kind of things are popping into my wee little mind right now. So even the word enlightenment suggests that this higher consciousness has something to do with light. But... One of the most exciting implications the discovery that our brains can produce light gives is that maybe our consciousness and spirit are not contained within our bodies. Uh, that's called dreaming, honey, or out-of-body experiences. And you can do that. This implication is completely overlooked by scientists because if by golly, if they can't reproduce it, or fudge the numbers, then it ain't real. Oh wait, that's scientism that fudges the numbers. That's right. Okay. So quantum entanglement says that two entangled photons react if one of the photons it is, is affected no matter where the other photon is, is in the universe without any delay. So in other words, thought if you get very good at it, if you concentrate, if you know how to, your thoughts travel to another individual instantaneously. No more wonky ass shit internet. Cool? That is very cool. So, maybe there is a world that exists within the light and no matter where you are in the universe, Photons can act as portals that enable communication between these two worlds. Maybe our spirit and consciousness communicate with our bodies through this biophotons. And the more light we produce, the more we awaken and embody the wholeness of our consciousness. Or maybe we're just really, really bright. You know, I know some people that are really, really bright that are not exactly the sharpest tool in the shed when it comes to common sense. So, <clears throat> this can explain the phenomenon of why the state of a photon is affected simply by consciously observing it, as it is proven in many quantum experiments, because once you observe it, you affect it. May, uh, maybe our observation communicates something through our biophotons with the photon that's being observed in a similar fashion as quantum entanglement.
like the light is just one unified substance that is scattered throughout our universe and affected through each little particle. Now, of course, nothing of this is even close to being a theory, but asking questions and shooting such metaphysical hypothesis might lead us closer to the truth and understanding of what consciousness is, where it comes from, and what are the mysteries that hide within the light. Come into the light. Just don't be blinded by it. There's quite a few people that get blinded by a lot of stuff. That's why you get blindsided. So, um, yay! Uh, okay put this over on the F side. I was trying to catch up in the chat too. For those of you that aren't in the chat, sometimes those little pregnant pauses which are not pregnant, <laughs> and if they do that means they're going to create an even bigger pause because it's coming, but it's biggin. Um, <laughs> could be scary. Okay, do we have one? Let's do the sparkly one. Do the sparkly guy. There you go. And maybe that one. So easy to do those. Okay, now that I've done that, you know, we've dealt with the brain on a couple of ways. Now let's look at a few other things that just might, um, yeah, we'll go to this one. It's from, <coughs> excuse me, October of 2016. And it's from Dr. Mercola, uh, tapnewswire.com to be precise. To protect your health and vision, stick to incandescent lights. In other words, don't be doing the fluorescence, don't be doing the LEDs. So, and it was written by Dr. Mercola. So can light affect your health? In this interview, Dr. Alexander Wunsch, a world-class expert on photobiology stages a, or shares the hidden dangers of light emitting diode or LED which they do emit radiation and uh, lighting that most people are completely unaware of. In fact this could potentially be one of the most important video interviews that this individual has done and if there is okay yeah there's a video at the end I had to scroll so um, okay, it has enormous impacts, not only on preventing blindness as you age, but it is also a pervasive hidden risk factor for sabotaging your health, largely as a result of energy efficiency. There's been a major transition to using LED as a primary indoor light source, and in this regard, it worked like a charm reducing energy requirements by as much as 95% compared to an incandescent thermal analog source of lighting. However, the heat generated by incandescent light bulbs, which is infrared radiation, is actually beneficial to your health and hence worth the extra cost. So you go stand underneath an incandescent light bulb, you're actually working on giving your body something that makes it feel better. How cool is that? Or at least that's the way I understood this. So, there are more major downsides to LEDs that are not fully appreciated. LED lighting may actually be one of the most important non-native EMF radiation exposures you're exposed to on a daily basis. And if you choose to ignore these new insights, it can have a very serious long-term ramifications. It could lead to age-related macular degeneration, uh, which is the leading cause of blindness in the United States and elsewhere, and other health problems rooted in mitochondrial dysfunction may also be exacerbated. And these run the gamut from uh, metabolic disorder to cancer, which, you know, 
I, I really am getting to the point where I don't think there is any real diseases out there. Every damn thing out there that they label as a disease is a symptom. It is a symptom of an internal dis-ease with your body. Your body is needing something or it's got too much of something in it that is poisoning it and that is being expressed by the cancer or the arthritis or the ulcers or the bad vision or what have you. All of those things are just expressions of the dis-ease in the body and there is no real cure to anything. There are things that help, that aid your body, that feed your body, that fuel your body so your body can repair itself. So there are no real cures. If there's no real diseases, they're just symptoms, then all this other shit is not a cure. It's just nutrition, proper nutrition proper supplements, proper fuel for your body to repair itself and fix its own damage. Hey, that's kind of a cool way of looking at it. And you can tell the FDA to kiss some my grits because I'm not curing nothing. I am just giving my body the proper fuel to repair itself. So, what is light? unlike the brain one. The definition of light as applied to artificial light sources is rather distinct. Visible light is only between 400 nanometers and 780 nanometers. But light is actually more than just what your eye can perceive. And goes on to explain, when you, we look at sunlight, we have a, excuse me, a much broader spectral range from somewhere around 300 nanometers to 2,000 nano nanometers or so. For our energy efficiency calculation, it makes a big difference if we're talking about this broad natural range or if we're talking about vision performance. The definition that we're, uh, we are only looking at the visible part of the spectrum, which was given in the 1930s. Uh, led or it led to the development of energy efficient light sources like the fluorescent lamps or whatever we have nowadays, the LED light sources, because they are only energy efficient as long as you take the visible part out of the spectrum. For example, lamps providing phototherapy with red light can be used in medical therapy to increase blood circulation. And this is a part that we are taking away as long as we only look at the visible part. Physicists think that infrared radiation is just thermal waste, but from the viewpoint of a physician, this is absolutely not true. In the last 30 years, there have been hundreds of scientific papers published on the benefits um, and the beneficial aspects of a certain part in the spectrum, which is called near-infrared or infrared A. So, what makes near-infrared so special? It's special. Well, you cannot feel near-infrared as heat, and you cannot see it, but it has a major beneficial impact in terms of health. Near-infrared is what's missing in non-thermal artificial light sources like LED. And there's also a difference between analog and digital forms of light sources. And this difference is another part of the complexity. In essence, there are two separate but related issues. The analog versus digital light source problem and the spectral wavelength differences. Now starting with the latter, when you look at a rainbow spectrum, the visible part of the light ends in red. Infrared A, or near infrared, is the beginning of the invisible light spectrum following red. This in turn is followed by infrared B, or mid infrared, and infrared C, which is far infrared. 
while we cannot while they cannot be seen with the human eye the mid and far range can be felt as heat and this does not apply to infrared a however it has a wavelength between 700 and 1500 nanometers so Um, here you only have very low absorption by water molecules, and this is the reason why radiation has a very high trans transmittance, Wunsch says. In other words, it penetrates very deeply into your tissue. So the energy distributes in a large tissue volume. This near-infrared A is not heating up the tissue, so you'll, you will not feel directly any effect of heat. This significantly changes when we increase the wavelength, let's say, to 2,000 nanometers. Here we're in infrared B range, and this already has, is felt as heat. And from 3,000 nanometers onto the longer wavelengths, we have almost full absorption, mainly by water molecule, and this is felt as heat. So, Near infrared is critical for mitochondrial and eye health. The near infrared ranges affects your health in a number of important ways. It helps prime the cells in your retina for repair and regeneration. And since LEDs have virtually no infrared and an excess of blue that generates reactive oxygen species, or ROS, this explains why LEDs are so harmful for your eyes and overall health. Now chromophores or molecules that absorb light and there's an optical tissue window that, window that ranges from 600 to 1400 nanometers which means it is almost completely covered by the infrared A part of the spectrum. This optical tissue window allows the radiation to penetrate several centimeters or at least an inch or more into the tissue. Now these chromophores are found in your mitochondria and in activated water molecules. In your mitochondria, there's also a specific molecule called cytochrome, uh, cytochrome C oxidase, whatever that is, which is involved in the energy production within the mitochondria. And then there's ATP, I'm not even going to try and say that word, which is cellular en energy, and um, that's the end product. Now, ATP is the fuel that your cells need for all of their varied functions. See? Feed your body the proper fuel, and it will repair itself, including ion transport, synthesizing, and metabolizing. Remarkably, your body produces your body weight in ATP every day. And while you can survive for several minutes without oxygen, where all ATP production to suddenly stop, you die within 15 seconds. That is a scary thought. So lighting plays an important role in biological energy production. And this is why this tissue of lighting is, or this issue of lighting is so important. Light is a sorely misunderstood and overlooked part of the equation for biological energy production, specifically at uh, the mitochondrial ATP level, as further explained by Dr. Munch. The cytochrome C oxidase, which is th uh, this light absorbing molecule, is the last step before the ATP is finally produced in the mitochondrial. And here we have this tipping point where light in the wavelength, ra wavelength range between 570 nanometers and 850 nanometers is able to boost energy production, especially in cells, when energy production is depleted. We know today that many signs of aging, for example, are the consequences of hampered mitochondrial functioning. And so we have a very interesting tool
to enhance the energy status of our cells in the mitochondria in our cells and not only on the surface but also in the depths of the tissue. This is one important aspect and there are hundreds of papers published on these positive effects. So, infrared saunas are another magnificent way to nourish your body with near infrared light and I know someone that has one of those. But not just any infrared sauna. Most offer only far infrared and are not full spectrum. Most also emit dangerous non-native EMFs, so you need one that emits low or no non-native EMFs. And after searching for a long time, I finally found a near perfect one and hope to have, have it made to my customized specs within a month. Oh, cool. That would be way cool. And it should be significantly less than $1,000, so that would really be cool. Do you know that you can do wound healing and anti-age procedures by making use of near-infrared? I remember reading about that a couple years ago for some silly reason. There's beneficial effects can be seen in wound healing and anti-aging procedures where near-infrared is employed. Since the cytochrome C oxidase is responsible for an increased production of ATP, the cell has a better supply of energy, which allows it to perform better. And this is true no matter where the cell resides. This means liver cells with more ATP will be able to detoxify your body more efficiently. Fibroblasts in your cells um, will be able to synthesize more collagen fibers and so on because ATP is crucial for all cellular functions. And according to Wunsch, as little as one third of the energy your body requires for maintaining the thermal equilibrium comes from the food you eat. The electrons transferred from the food, primarily the fats and the carbohydrates, are ultimately transferred to oxygen and generate ATP. And the more near infrared you get, the less nutritional energy is required for maintaining thermal homeostasis. In other words, if you get a lot of natural light, which I know when I'm out in the summer a lot, I'm, I'm, th this just popped into my head. If I'm outside in the summer a lot, getting a lot of that natural sun, now I do cover myself a little bit better because I don't like that burn and peel freckle thing. You know, I mean, I don't mind the freckles, but the burning and peeling is not fun. But if I'm outside getting a lot of natural sunlight, I'm not nearly as hungry. I don't eat near, and it's, you know, even when it's not hot, hot, you know, like in the spring and in the fall when we've still got plenty of light coming and I'm still out playing in the yard, I just, I don't get, I get hungry in the winter time. <laughs> I get really hungry in the winter time, and I usually gain a good 10 pounds, and then I work it off spring through fall, and then I gain it back. <laughs> it's just a cycle. So. That's the way I equate this, at least. You don't need to intake as much food if you're outside getting the energy from the sunlight or natural light sources. Now, that said, a different uh, differentiation is in order. Most of the meta um, metabolo metabolically used, there you go, spit it out. Most of the metabolically used energy does come from food, but there is a thermodynamic aspect to it as well. So maintaining a normal body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit, involves two mechanisms, energy production in your mitochondria from food and photon energy, which is near infrared radiation from sunlight and excuse me, incandescent light bulbs. And that is able to penetrate deeply into your tissue, even through your clothing. The radiation can enter your body and then be transformed into longer wavelengths in the infrared part. And they are very important for, for supporting the temperature level, the thermal energy level of your body. 
which is very critical aspect. A lot of energy comes in the form of radiation and this is supporting our thermal balance. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the key take home message here is that your body's energy production involves not just food intake. You also need exposure to certain wavelengths of light in order for your metabolism to function optimally. This is yet another reason why sun exposure is so vitally important for optimal health. Vitamin D. You get sunlight, your body produces vitamin D. And then you need to eat properly in other, other aspects as well so that you can use that vitamin D properly. So, now for the analog versus digital lighting. LED lamps are a form of digital non-thermal lighting whereas incandescent light bulbs and halogens are analog thermal light sources. So for a color changing system you have three different LEDs, a red, a green, and a blue LED. And the intensity of these three colored channels has to be changed in order to achieve different color use, which is perceived by the eye in the end. And the control of the intensity output of the LED is realized in the digital manner because it's very difficult to have a low intensity in many different steps. The dimming of LEDs is realized by so-called pulse width modulation, which means the LEDs switch um, LEDs switch on to the full intensity and then they fully switch off and then they switch on again. So it's kind of sounds to me like a really fast strobe. So we have the constant on off on off in frequencies which are higher than our eyes are able to discriminate. But on the cellular level it's still perceivable for the cells. And this causes a flicker which is not perceivable for let's say 90% of the population but it's still biologically active and flicker is something that is very harmful for your biology. Yeah, I don't think I, I can't stand to be in a room with a strobe for more than a couple minutes because yeah, messes with my brain let me tell you. So. You've likely experienced this if you're old enough to recall the older TVs that had the very visible intense flicker. <laughs> yeah, I remember those. And modern flat screens do not have the perceptible flicker, but they are still switching on and off. And scientists are now trying to develop systems capable of transmitting information via high frequency flicker in the LED lighting to replace the wireless LAN system. Uh, that doesn't sound good. Yeah, and Dr. Wunsch says this is a very bad idea, at least from the health perspective. But it's science and they want to find out and they're going to find out on you because, well, you're such a good little guinea pig. Um, goes on to say that he calls these LEDs Trojan horses because they appear so practical to us. They appear to have so many advantages. They save energy, are solid state and very robust. We must invite them into our homes, but we are not aware that they have many stealth, health robbing properties, which are harmful to your biology, harmful to your mental health, harmful to your retinal health, and also harmful to your hormonal and endocrine health. Unfortunately, the use of LEDs has been mandated by federal policy in both the U.S. and much of Europe in an attempt to conserve energy. While inarguably effective in that regard, the biological impact of these bulbs has been completely ignored and by mandating them, options have been restricted. Now I have one LED light in my house. One. And uh, it was like, oh, well, and actually it's a little hallway light that doesn't get turned on very often. But from what I understand, even not being turned on, they still, and I know this because I had it in another light fixture that had one of those lighted light switches. And when you turned it off, it still had a glow to it. And it was like, that ain't right. 
So I took it out of that fixture and put it in the hallway that did not have the lighted switch, and it doesn't glow. But I'll bet you it's still got, I bet you, because I'm, I'm suspicious like that. Now for understanding the dangers of LEDs. They can harm your health. That's begin with, uh, with the, and, um, okay. LEDs can harm your health. Begins with the recognition that light emitted from an LED bulb is of a different quality than the natural light source. Normally, a natural light source is a black body radiator that gives off all kinds of wavelengths in a more or less continuous manner. LEDs are fluorescent lamps consisting of blue LED, a driver LED, and a fluorescent sheet that covers the blue LED, transforming part of the bulb light, blue light, into longer wavelengths, thereby creating a yellowish light. Now the yellowish light from the fluorescent layers combines together with the residual blue light to a kind of whitish light, and a large portion of which is an aggressive blue light. Now, blue has the highest energy in the visible part of the spectrum and produces, infuses, the production of ROS, which is oxidative stress. I need a drink. A blue light special. It's really special. The blue light causes ROS in your tissues, and this stress needs to be balanced with near-infrared that is not present in LEDs. We need even more regeneration from blue light. But the regenerative part of the spectrum is not found in the blue in the short wavelength part. It's found in the long wavelength part, in the red and near infrared. So tissue regeneration and tissue repair results from wavelengths that are not present in an LED spectrum. We have increased stress on short wavelength parts, and we have reduced regeneration and repair on the long wavelength parts. This is the primary problem. We don't have this kind of light quality in nature. This has consequences. The stress has consequences in the retina, and it has consequences in our endocrine system. So. You probably know by now that blue light in an evening reduces melatonin production in the pineal gland, but you also have cells in your retina that are responsible for producing melatonin in order to regenerate the retina during the night. Now, if you use LED lights after sunset, you reduce the regenerative and restoring capacities of your eyes. Needless to say, with less regeneration, you end up with degeneration. And in this case, the degeneration can lead to AMD, which is a um, macular degeneration, which is the primary cause of blindness among the elderly. However, this is that most fail to appreciate LED light exposure that is not balanced with full sunlight loaded with red parts of the spectrum is always damaging to your body, just more so at night. So to summarize, the main problem with LEDs is the fact that they emit primarily blue wavelengths and lack the counterbalancing healing and regenerative near-infrared frequencies. They have very little red in them and no infrared, which is the wavelength required for repair and regeneration. So when you use these aggressive lower frequencies, blue light, it creates ROS. And when generated in excess, it causes damage. So when using LEDs, you end up with increased damage and decreased repair and regeneration. So. Are there any healthy LEDs out there? Well, there's a wide range of them on the market these days, and some are cool white, others are warm white, 
and uh, the former emits higher amounts of harmful blue light. The warm LEDs can be deceptive as they give out a warm appealing light but do not actually have the red wavelength. The warmth comes from masking the blue with higher amounts of yellow and orange. There's also LEDs available with less blue which are closer to spectral distribution of incandescent lamps with regard to the blue part of the spectrum. Unfortunately, without tools to measure it, you won't know exactly what you're getting. And this is in sharp contrast to incandescent light bulbs where you know exactly what kind of light spectrum you're getting. So, when buying LEDs, one way to get the healthier light is to look for the CRI. Sunlight is the gold standard and has a CRI of 100. So do incandescent light bulbs and candles. So what you're looking for is a light that has an R9, which is full red spectrum, and CRI of about 97, which is the closest you'll ever get to a natural light with an LED. Another factor to look at is the color temperature. And there are two different kinds of color temperature. There's the physical color temperature, which means that the temperature of your light in degrees Kelvin. And this applies to sunlight, candlelight, incandescent light, lamp, and halogens. What this means is that the source itself is as hot to, to, to the touch as the color temperature given. Now the sun, for example, which has a color temperature of 5,500 Kelvin, has a temperature of 5,500 Kelvin at its surface. Were you to actually touch the sun? No thanks. Uh, stay a healthy distance. Incandescent lamps have a maximum 3,000 Kelvin, as the filament would melt if the temperature got any higher. Now correlated color temperature, uh, this measurement tells you how the light source appears to the human eye. In other words, it's a comparative measurement. And the correlated color temperature of 2,700 Kelvin means that it looks the same as a natural light with a physical color temperature of 2,700 Kelvin. Problem here is that while it looks, the light looks the same as natural light, it does not actually have the same quality. And your body, on the cellular level, is not fooled by what your eyes sees. On the cellular level, and on the level of the retina, the majority of the light is still cold, bluish white, despite the apparent visible warmth. So incandescent light bulbs have a color temperature of 2700K, whereas LEDs can go up to 6500K. The really bright white LED, wow, that is really, really high. And in this case, the closer you are to the incandescent, the better. Lastly, there's a digital component, which is virtually unavoidable no matter what. So to, ter to determine how good or bad a particular LED is, a simpler way would be to purchase a flicker detector, which are available fairly inexpensively. And another way to determine the flicker rate would be to use a slow motion mode on your camera. Record the light source in slow motion mode and check it for visible flickering. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work. And some newer cameras and smartphones have a built-in algorithm that will detect the flicker frequency and change the shutter speed accordingly to improve the recording, thereby eliminating the interference. So if your camera has this algorithm, it will not record the visible flicker, even if it's there. So, healthier solutions? Well, I like being on the cutting edge of technology and I quickly switched out all of my incandescent bulbs for LED lighting and I now realize the uh, enormity of my mistake. But at that time, going back almost 10 years, I was completely unaware that it could have health consequences. 
Before that, I used full spectrum fluor uh, fluorescence, which is equally deceptive, as it is full spectrum in name only. I'm now convinced LED light exposure is a very serious danger, especially if you're in a room with natural light. The biological risks are somewhat mitigated, but if you are, have plenty of sunlight streaming through the windows. Now at night, LEDs become a greater danger no matter whether you have a windowless room or not, as there is no counterbalance of near infrared light. Personally, I've not swapped out all of my lights back to incandescent because they're such energy hogs, but all the lights I have on at night have been switched to clear incandescent bulbs without any coating that changes their beneficial wavelengths. So the take home message of this interview is to grab a supply of old incandescents if you can switch back to the incandescent light bulbs. Just remember to get incandescents that are crystal clear and not coated with white to give off the cool white light. You want the 2700K incandescent thermal analog light source. Actually, fragrance-free candles would be even better. Be particularly mindful to only use the type of this type of light at night after sunset. And I also use blue blocking glasses. Well, I'd never thought of the blue blocking glasses. Hmm. Okay. And then he's got a lot of graphs and spectrums and a little bit more here, but I, like I said, I've got one LED bulb in my house. Everything else is incandescent. But I don't, I don't turn lights on normally. I mean, in the morning, the kitchen light gets turned on to make coffee. And in the evening, the kitchen light gets turned on to finish up supper if I need extra light. Other than that, nah. I leave my lights off in the house because I I got windows I can see just fine. So share this. That seemed rather long and uh, da -da. anti quit again. Moosey left. Gosh darn it. Being bright. All kind of brightness tonight. And speaking of brightness, it's about that time. I need to go check out the pig. See what them bright fellers are doing. Lord only knows what those two are up to. Okay, let me see if I can find a bright bulb. <laughs> Here, we'll do this. I do the sunshine. I don't usually scroll way down on the little emojis, but I did for that one. Okay. Let me go check out. Thank you, Dr. Mercola, by the way. Go check out the pig. See what them boys are up to. And then if I still have some time left, I still got a couple things in my pocket that I thought about getting to this evening. So, on this Freaker Friday evening where it's going to be balls to the wall this evening because Miss Moose has a life. Darn it. No debate. What's your pick of the day? I absolutely refuse to debate gun control with people who eat laundry soap and don't know what bathroom to use. Okay, Sam Elliott, I get that. I get that. I understand completely. Over here on PIG, PIGazette.com, their word of the day is inertia. It is a noun. It's a byproduct of a political gravity which immobilizes the elephant clan who shelter in place between election cycles to elude accountability by doing nothing. Well, you know, they talk a lot out of both ends. And yeah, they accomplish even less. And the few things that they do accomplish usually causes pain to the rest of us. So, which is why they usually sit on their hands and play with their ass. In the quotable quotes section, 
if you talk individual rights, then you're talking about the equal right of everyone to pursue an income or to pursue health care and to be sovereign over his or her own life. You own what you create. You own what's yours. You can give it all away if you like, but nobody may take it from you, least of all the government. That's from Dr. Hurd, and okay, I agree with that. I agree with that. Although I think the best health care is the one that feeds your system properly. Okay, in the Tasty Tidmits, aphorisms, A-P-H-O-R-I-S-M-S. -S. Apparently, it's a short pointed sentence that expresses a wise or clever observation or a general truth. So, number one, the nicest thing about the future is that it always starts tomorrow. Um, yeah, yeah. Number two, money will buy a fine dog, but only kindness will make him wag his tail. Yes, that is true. Number three, if you don't have a sense of humor, you probably don't have any sense at all. I know some people like that. They have fewer sense than a skunk, and a skunk only has one, and it's bad. Number four, seat belts are not as confining as wheelchairs. And yet, I do not think they should be mandated. It's called personal responsibility. Number five, a good time to keep your mouth shut is when you're in deep water. Yeah, yeah, get that. Number six, how come it takes so little time for a child who is afraid of the dark to become a teenager who wants to stay out all night? Oh, you know, it's because when you're having fun, time really flies. And then when they become teenager, it just drags because you're such a drag. <laughs> Number seven, business conventions are important because they demonstrate how many people a company can operate without. Wow, if that ain't true, I don't know what the hell. Man, that really is true. Um, number eight, why is it that at class reunions you feel younger than everyone else looks? Excuse me. Oh. <laughs> you know, I actually went to my class reunion last year, last October, and I can relate to that. Number nine, stroke a cat and you will have a permanent job. That's the truth. By God, my cats know. One pet. And it's like, oh, now you started, now you are my slave. Number 10, no one has more driving ambition than the teenage boy who wants to buy a car. That may have been true back when you had to earn the money to buy a car. Nowadays, I don't know how it works. And number 11, there are no new sins. The old ones just get more publicity. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Okay, and here's another one from Wild Pigs. A thought to remember, Mark said, remove one freedom per generation and soon you will have no freedom and no one would have noticed. There was a chemistry professor in a large college uh, that had some exchange students in the class. One day, while the class was in the lab, the professor noticed one young man, an exchange student, who kept rubbing his back and stretching as if his back hurt. The professor asked him uh, what, the what was the matter, and the student told him that he had a bullet lodged in his back. He had been shot while fighting communists in his native country who were trying to overthrow his country's government and install a new communist regime. Now, in the midst of his story, he looked at the professor and asked a strange question. Um, he said, do you know how to watch wild pigs? And the professor thought and thought it was a joke and asked for the punchline. And the young man said that it was no joke. You catch wild pigs by finding a suitable place in the woods 
putting corn on the ground, the pigs find it and begin to come every day to eat the free food. So, when they're used to coming every day, you put a fence down one side of the place where they are used to coming. And when they get used to the fence, they begin to eat the corn again and you put up another side of the fence. Then they get used to that and start to eat again. And you can til continue until you have all four sides of the fence up with a gate at the last side. The pigs, which are used to the free corn, start to come through the gate to eat that fat corn again. And you slam the gate on them and catch the whole herd. Suddenly, the wild pigs have lost their freedom. They run around and around inside the fence, but they are caught. Soon they go back to eating the free corn, and they are so used to it that they have forgotten how to forage in the woods for themselves, so they accept their captivity. The young man then told the professor, that is exactly what he sees happening in America and Canada. The government keeps pushing us toward communism and socialism and keeps spreading the free corn out in the form of programs such as supplemental income, tax credit for unearned income, tax exemptions, tobacco subsidies, dairy subsidies, payments not to plant crops, CRP, welfare entitlements, medicine, drugs, etc while we continually lose our freedoms, just a little at a time. One should always remember two truths. There is no such thing as a free lunch, and you can never hire someone to provide a service for you cheaper than you can do it yourself. So, if you see all of this wonderful government quote-unquote help is a problem confronting the future of democracy in America and Canada, you might want to just kind of share that one. And if you think the free ride is essential to your way of life, then you will probably not share. But God help us when they slam that gate shut, which is why I am 100% against that damn wall to the south. They're selling it as keeping the bad people out, but it's also going to keep people in. It tightens the noose. Now recently, Henry Kissinger did an interview that said some very amazing things regarding POTUS Trumpelstiltskin. He starts with Donald Trump is a phenomenon that foreign countries haven't seen. The former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, gives us a new understanding of POTUS Trumpelstiltskin's foreign policy and predicts its, its success. Liberals and all those who favor Schittlery will never admit it. They will never admit that he has done, is one true leader. Now, this is coming from Kissinger, mind you. The man is doing changes that, like never before, and does all of it for the sake of this nation's people. After eight years of tyranny, we finally see a difference. Okay, Kissinger was butt buddies with Dangleberry, too. Don't forget that. Kissinger knows it, and he re continues with, every country now has to consider two things. One, their perception that the previous POTUS or the outgoing POTUS basically withdrew America from international politics so that they had to make their own assessment of their necessities. And secondly, that there is a new POTUS who's asking a lot of unfamiliar questions. And because of the combination of the partial vacuum and the new questions, one could imagine that something remarkable and new emerges out of it. Then Kissinger puts it bluntly. Trumple Stilskin puts America and its people first. <coughs> yeah, yeah, kissy baby. This is why people love him, and this is why he will remain in charge for so long. There is not a single thing wrong with him, and people need to open their eyes. Okay, you really need to be concerned if Kissinger is going to bat for Trumple Stilskin. Something fishy is going on. 
Mm. When he boasts that he has a bigger red button than Kim Jong-un does, he so transcends the mealy mouth rhetoric of the past that he forces a new recognition of American power. See, and that's, that's that whole power broker thing. The bully on the block bullshit. We don't want that. Kissinger once wrote, The Weak Grow Strong by Effrontery. Eff okay? And the strong grow weak through inhibition. No sentence better captures the U.S.-North Korea relationship. Trumples is discarding the inhibitions and calling the bluff on North Korea's bombacity, if you will. His point is that the contrast of American retreat under Dengleberry and its new assertion of power under Trumpel-Stilskin creates a new dynamic that every one of our allies and our enemies must consider. In other words, lots of bluff and bluster going on and nobody's figured out if he's bluffing or not. Our allies grew complacent with Dengleberry's passivity which, yeah, except for when he was bombing the shit out of people. And now are fearful due to Trumpel's activism. And they must balance the two in developing their policies. They realize that the old assumptions catalyzed by Bush 43's preoccupation with Iraq and Dangleberry's refusal to lead are obsolete. So, Trumpel's is forcing a new calculus with a new power behind American interests. Oh, that's as scary as hell. Those here and abroad who rode the old apple cart worry about its being toppled, which I would love to see that apple cart toppled. I would love to see that happen. There's a lot of people that need to roll. But, as Kissinger states, Trumpels is one true leader in world affairs and he is forcing policy changes that put America first. That, yeah, right. It's Kissinger, mind you. Can't trust that man for nothing. The evil is just oozing out of his pores. But thanks, guys, for sharing that one here. Now, for this date in history. The 8th of June, 452. We're going way back in time. A man with chronic unresolved issues with damn near everybody, Attila the Hun, spends quality time in Italy, brings army with him. Damn tourists, yeah, that damn Attila. This date in history, the 8th of June, 570, in Mecca. The world's oldest running joke, Islam, the religion of peace, rears its jihadakazi head for the first time. Never got past that does not play well with others problem. And lastly, this date in history, the 8th of June, 1936, some rat bastard perverts technology by inventing the parking meter. That is a rat bastard. Most definitely. Most definitely. They've also got a rather interesting top story over here. And there's uh, all kinds of other fun stuff, from the Prattler to all kinds of links on both sides of this thing. So come on over to PIGazette.com. Check out and see what these guys are up to. Because, yeah, they're... Ah, June apparently is Joe Friday month. Don't put up with political, political problem. Demand just the facts. Well, you know... There is going to be political bloviating no matter what. So long as there are politicians, there will be blowhards. Okay, Grimmy shot the duck. Okay. Unregistering? Mmm. <laughs> yeah, Grimmy. Hey, baby, check out my big... Uh, no, I don't want to check out nobody's big red button. That just sounds gross. Sounds like an infection. Don't want to go there. Okay, I got a few minutes left, so let's go back to my pocket. I do have a couple other things I want to get to here. So, do I want to do... Yeah... 
Um, I've got a couple of them here that I'll probably just share. One of them is from healthnutnews.com. A CBC holistic doctor is under investigation for speaking out about vaccinations. And I've got another one here. Cancer researcher says she was threatened over apricot seeds and apple seeds because they have um, vitamin B17 in them. And actually, when you eat an apple, eat the core and all. Bite, make sure you bite the seeds. I know they're not really tasty, but you need that vitamin B17 that's inside of those apple seeds. Wash your apple good, though. You need to wash it good. I suggest using hy um, hydrogen peroxide for washing it and soapy water. You know, do the hydrogen peroxide first and then do your soapy water. I do that with my apples. But I want to go to Jordan Peterson just because I kind of like Jordan Peterson. What's that 50 years later? Oh, NSA keeps details of Israel's USS Liberty attack secret. Ah, yeah, I saw something about that the other day about the USS Liberty. I'm going to have to, I will, I'll send Porcus a message about that. Let him know he's fallen asleep on the job. Actually, it's Hambo's lovely bride that a lot of times comes up with that. But uh, I don't converse with her that often. But I can send Porcus a message and tell him, dude, yeah, this date in history, 50 years ago, the USS Liberty was attacked by Israel and LBJ didn't do nothing. Didn't do nothing. Because LBJ was a weenus. Okay, back to this. From the LATimes.com. Hate on Jordan Peterson all you want, but he's tapping into frustration that feminists should not ignore. One of the most controversial public intellectuals today is an eccentric primly dressed professor who writes about esoteric mythology, dispenses old-fashioned wisdom such as clean your room, and champions embattled ideals of manhood. Dr. Jordan Peterson, University of Toronto psychologist and best-selling author and YouTube star, has been hailed by some as a messenger of hope for young men perplexed by cultural upheaval and denounced by others as a charlatan preaching patriarchy and fascism. Well, you got your finger pointers and you got your, really, you can do it different? You don't have to be like that? Wow. In reality, Peterson's ideas are a mixed bag. He says some sensible and insightful things, and he says some things that rightly draw criticism. But you wouldn't know this from reading Peterson's critics who generally cast him as far-right boogeyman riding the wave of a mycinogen, mis mis but whatever, backlash. <laughs> Misogynistic. There you go. I knew I would get it spit out eventually. Yeah. And that's a mistake. For all his flaws, Peterson is tapping into a very real frustration. More than half a century after the modern feminist revolution began in the 60s, we have yet to figure out new roles for partnership between men and women. Well, you know, partnership is everyone helps out where it's needed. Period. That's what real partnership is. You don't one-up each other. You don't go, that's your job, and that's your job. A real partnership is if something needs done, you jump in and you tend to it. If you can't do it, then you ask the other one if they will help you. Now, <clears throat> although Peterson can sound like a chauvinistic crank when he seems to suggest that women incite sexual harassment by wearing makeup to the office, his larger points that evolving norms are generating confusion and mixed signals, and that women play a role in sexualizing work environments as far from absurd. Which, you know, ladies, if you do not wish to have someone harassing you, and I'm not, I'm not saying that 
See, there's, a, there's a multiple sides to this little thing here. But if you really don't want to have someone harassing you about your legs or your short skirt or something like that, stop wearing it to the frickin' office. There is, you know, proper work attire. Unless you work somewhere where that is part of the uniform. But if you're going to go dressing to where you got the girls hanging out and your butt cheeks all butt hanging out, and then you call someone else out for saying, you look good today. Excuse me? Excuse me. If, you're not, if you do not wish someone to comment on your appearance, do not dress in a manner that is going to draw attention to your appearance. Hey, That just really pisses me off. All these women that go, Well, he sexually harassed me. He said I look good. That outfit looks good on you. That's what he said to me. That's sexual harassment. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's someone paying you a compliment, you sh nitwit. And if you do not wish to be paid compliments, put on a frickin' potato sack. Oy. This goes on to say, now consider, we rejected traditional sexist proprieties that forbade coarse language in front of the ladies, yet a man can now be fired for telling a crude joke that offends a female co-worker. Calling women the weaker sex would be considered shockingly retrograde, yet ambivalent sexual encounters are easily recast as violations of women, with men presumed entirely responsible for ensure, yeah, ensuring consent. Workplace romances abound, yet flirting could be one step away from someone's idea of sexual harassment. Uh-huh. So if feminists don't like Peterson's mes message, they should offer a better one. Yeah, but they don't. And feminism was started by the Rockefellers. Check it out. In this, bewildering, in this bewildering environment, Peterson offers a code of personal responsibility and self-discipline. Although his message appeals to both genders, the core of his fan base and the focus of his world-saving fervor are young men. Indeed, one of Peterson's central themes is that men in the Western world are in crisis, and I really think they are. I really do. But I also think women are in crisis, in, in crisis as well because they're buying into the bullshit. Both sides are buying into the bullshit. Yes. Uh, Grim, it depends on if she wants to sleep with you or not. If she doesn't want to sleep with you, then it's inappropriate and you're sexually harassing her. But if she wants to sleep with you, then it's just an office flirtation and you have to buy drinks later. That's how that works. Um, yeah. Back to this. So, crisis or no, there is certainly evidence that many men and boys have been left struggling by the cultural transformations of recent decades. In 2013, MIT study titled Wayward Sons, it notes that boys are more likely than girls to be negatively affected by parental divorce, that young men are less likely to go to college or even complete high school, and that working class men are more likely than working class women to be left behind by economic shifts, and that those who lose out in the labor market are likely to face poor prospects for marriage and fatherhood. Peterson sees a feminist assault on masculinity as a major culprit. And it's it, feminism. It's an ism. Yes. Uh, Smurf. <laughs> that is true, Rob Works. That is true. I think a man, but you know, guys would guys would be shamed for doing that but I think men need to start doing that I really do I think men need to start filing sexual harassment complaints against women 
and say, I'm sorry, but she is making the work environment entirely too uncomfortable with her low-cut blouse and her short skirt. This is, this is just, I, these are uncomfortable working conditions and I don't have to put up with this. And you know, have the men do, fire it right back at them. Because you know what? You'll get a lot of spitting and sputtering. Yeah, Grammy, I know. Working class. In any case, Peterson does see the feminist assault on masculinity as a major culprit, although that is much too simplistic an explanation. It's also true that in its current form, feminism certainly isn't helping. How about humanism? Get rid of the feminism and manonism or malonism or whatever the hell the ism it is. I don't know. I don't care. Wait a minute. Hey, I have... A, no, I'm not telling you. <laughs> Despite the occasional lip service to the idea that feminism can liberate men too from patriarchal confines, most feminist uh, discourse spends far more time bashing men for trivial trans transgressions. Yeah. Trivial. Like, I got an emotional boo-boo. Treat me like an equal. Oh, yeah. Really? I'll treat you as an equal when you start behaving like an equal. When you start demanding that someone must be punished because you have an emotional boo-boo, you need to grow the fuck up. There's your F-bomb for the night. The fact that the word masculinity so often appears next to the word toxic says a lot about this cultural movement. So does the proliferation of neil... N what? Yeah, whatever. Neologisms? What? Neologisms. Whatever the hell that is. For bad behavior with man as a prefix for, you know, like, mansplaining and manspreading. Mean meanwhile, male trousers are met with, what about the men's mockery? Uh-huh. So just look at the debate about Peterson. British journalist Helen... Helen Lewis has jeered that he he is viewed as a serious intellectual because he's writing for sad young white men. And their problems are, you know, real problems. No, he's writing for humans, you stupid biaw. Peterson doesn't necessarily offer good solutions. His constructive advice comes with some dubious tra traditionalist baggage. So... Healthy women, he writes in his book, Twelve Rules for, of Life, who want a man, um, or, okay, healthy women, he writes in his book, Twelve Rules of Life, want men who outclass them in intelligence, dominance, and status. I think healthy women want men that are equal, or are good sparring partners, if you will, if you're wanting to discuss things. I know I prefer someone that's got some brains to him. Though he has said that both sexes must adapt to a new world in which women have freedom and auto autonomy. And he sometimes appears to pander to nostalgia for a world in which men were men and women were housewives. How about we just have men are men and women are women and just call it good? And if the woman wants to stay home and take care of the kids, fine. If the daddy wants to stay home and take care of the kids, fine. Not a problem. Sharing of responsibilities. Actually saves you money when you think about all of the extra expenses of having two uh, family heads working and, you know, the commuting and child care and all of the other expenses in that. If you actually put a pencil to it, you're better off with only one person working. Put a pencil to it. You'd be surprised. Especially when it comes down to tax time. Oh, well. She goes on to say, These contradictions, along with Peterson's penchant for woolly language, are partly responsible for the confusion around what he really believes. But his detractors often go out of their way to put a sinister spin on his comments rather than understand the need he is meeting. 
For all its successes, contemporary feminism's main message to men is not one of equal partnership. Rather, it's repent, abase yourself, and be an obedient feminist ally. And we still won't trust you. It's no wonder Peterson has found an eager audience in this climate. If feminists don't like his message, they really should offer a better one. That was written by Kathy Young, who is a contributing editor at Reason Magazine. So, y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 3. What? What if the kids want you to leave them the fuck alone? Well, mm, yeah. And yeah, Rob, I get that, man. That, that man's planning works as well misogynist and misogyny thank you mm, a machismo yeah i'm reading the chat um in any case be sure to stick around because grimmy's going to be on later with balls to the wall here on this freaker friday evening then no dork table tomorrow dork table is on hiatus for a while um oh and chloe's having a shot of patron chloe share with the rest of the class brat <clears throat> in any case noon eastern time on sunday grimner will be playing the blues and there will be a rousing game of trivia going on in the rlm chat directly following grimner on sunday will be hal anthony who's going to open up a can of whoop ass on yo ass out behind the woodshed you best be for paying tation and tell them crickets to shut up because you're trying to hear also, Sunday evening, 7 o'clock Eastern Time, Gary Ellen Gigi's Boo with The Road Less Traveled. Thank you once again for listening in to The Rocket Chair. I will be back on Wednesday for the Wackadoodle Wednesday edition of The Rocket Chair. But until then, y'all have an absolutely amazing weekend, and uh, I will catch up with y'all later on. But I think I am going to, it's cooled down a bit. I'm going to step outside for a bit. Get me some more of that natural sunlight. So, please remember, I truly do love you all. And I wish you all enough. Good night.